The return to Earth was swift and extremely bumpy. The result was the most photographed nose in Britain. I recall it was in uh, Jamaica one day, national, and the one day wicket and the test match wicket was quite uneven. And uh, obviously, Mike, as I said before, is a strong puller and a cutter. And I think it was, I think it was always going to be a dinner shot to play on that surface because the wicket was up and down. And it's very hard to actually know the height of the ball is going to come to carry to you majority of times. And he selected the wrong one to play the shot, and I think it came off his glove onto his nose, which was a sad incident. At least it made it a lot better looking now. After you get a bonk on the nose, the initial thing, the sort of the eye smart, and then all of a sudden you just got you got a bloody nose and, and what have you. Unfortunately, I had a sort of a gash in there, about sort of two inches, sort of L shape, and it needed some stitches. Actually, I went in the dressing room and went to blow my nose, and it all just popped out. The boys weren't too happy, especially the guys waiting to go in next. The funny thing is, I went to pick the ball up. I wanted to actually pick the ball, but I saw this piece of ball in it, so I was so scared, I just dropped it <laughs> and I left it there. The great story about that was that when he got back to, Lon back to London, with his nose rearranged, two plasters going across, X marks the spot, some very observant journalist had to ask the question, now where exactly did it hit you? After flying home for repairs, it was typical of the man that he should return within a month, ready and willing to fracture more bones for Queen and country. His reward was a broken thumb, sustained on the eve of the third test. That was me out again for another three weeks. So I decided not to send me home, so I just sort of waited around. I tried to get back for the <coughs> Trinidad test match. I had to miss the one-day match. Couldn't make it for the Trinidad test match. So I managed to play in the last match at uh, Antigua. Come the fifth test in Antigua, England were already four down in the series. There was no need to risk further punishment. All one needs to know about his dedication and commitment is that a stable full of wild horses couldn't have dragged him away. And Malcolm didn't disappoint me. Bowled round the wicket and let me have two or three bounces first ball. And I think the first one, I <laughs> more nervous and adrenaline than any. Bowled it short and I just flat batted him. Went straight back, sort of didn't go for four, went for two or three, uh, and then it was all on. Um, but. I got back in. I'm glad I did it that way. Uh, I think that was a way for me to do it. I sometimes take him for granted, and um, uh, you know he gets a he gets a whack, which puts some people out of the game for two or three weeks. Um, and it you know it didn't occur to me. It was, I think it was a couple of seasons ago. He, he got he got a, a bad whack. I said, "Well, you'll be all right for tomorrow," and he said. I hurt sometimes, you know. He said, you don't think I ever get hurt? He said, but it does hurt sometimes. And he said, I'm, you know, I'm human as well. These qualities were recognised the following summer in a manner that produced very mixed feelings in a person as loyal as Mike. Criticised by the media for being too laid back and not slapping enough wrists, Gao was relieved of his duties after India had won the first test at Lord's. Well, it certainly came and landed in front of me. It wasn't uh, in any way in the nicest circumstances whatsoever. Uh, it was sort of in the middle of a series two. Uh, people didn't really know whether they were coming or going, I don't think. Although there was an inkling that uh, things were going to change. But uh, I hadn't really thought about it at all. Um, in no way did I really, to be honest with you, want the job. I was very happy playing. I uh, really was. I mean, being sort of a, uh, if you like, a second lieutenant, someone like David. You know, if David wanted me there, it was great. I mean, David, I, you know, there's no ways at all I was anyway after the job whatsoever. And it was just very sad the way it happened because, as I say, David gave me my chance, and there was no ways I would, would actually really want to do anything of the sort to him. And it was just so sad the way it happened. And you know, David obviously very upset, and it just. You know, it all just happened in, in a very sad way. Prior to that test match, prior to the Texaco Trophy Series actually against India that year, I'd had some T-shirts printed up that one of the allegations made in the West Indies was that I might have lost control of the side of it. 
And so I had T-shirts printed up, one for me saying I'm in charge and 12 for the others saying I'm not. So when the change came, it seemed a good time just to say, right, here's the T-shirt, you're in charge, now you take the T-shirt and good luck to you, you know, hope it goes well for you. But it's always hard, of course, when you, when you take over from a previous captain, that previous captain is still in the side, there's always a tendency to remember the fact that he was in charge, he was giving the orders. And he even had this thing where you know, it took him probably three or four months to stop calling me Skip. So I had to you know, remind the guy, say, no, you're Skip, me player. After losing his first test in charge, Mike took the lead in a typical fashion at Edgbaston with an unbeaten 183.